Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Rohr. I'm the Deputy Director of the GDC Global Archives, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, which is made possible by the generous support of the Miriam Mimi Pasternak Tobin Public Educational Programming from the GDC Archives. Some of you may not be that familiar with us, so I'd like to say a few words about the GDC Archives. The GDC Archives holds the records of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, also known as the GDC, since its creation over 100 years ago. Scholars from around the world, as well as filmmakers, journalists, family researchers, use our collections for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in our archives. And one of these fellowships is the Saul and Lauren Chessin GDC Archives Fellowship, which was established in 2015 with a generous gift uh, from Dr. Saul and Lauren Chessin. Uh, Saul and Lauren Chessin are with us today, and I would like to thank them on behalf of the GDC Archives. Saul Chessin will actually introduce our speaker today, Yuri Kaparolin, who received this fellowship um, in 2023. After um, Saul Chessin's introduction, Yuri Kaparolin will give his lecture for about 45 minutes. This will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please note that your um, microphones are muted and uh, you can send us your question via the Q&A function on Zoom and you can send us your questions at any time during the lecture or during the Q&A. So Al Chessin will now introduce Yuri Kaparolin. Our presenter, Yuri Kaparolin, is an associate professor at the Department of National and International Law and Law Enforcement and director of the Raphael Lemkin Center for Genified Studies at Kherson State University in Ukraine. He studies the history and law of Eastern Europe with particular interests in Holocaust and genocide studies, human rights, crimes against humanity, and political repression in the Soviet Union and during World War II. His research has been published in numerous journals, including the Ideology and Politics Journal Colloquia Humanistica, Eastern Europe, Holocaust Studies, and Ukraina Moderna. Yuri has received fellowships from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Yahad Unum in Paris, France, the New Europe College in Bucharest, Romania, and the Center for Holocaust Studies at the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, Germany. He is currently a fellow at the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia and a visiting scholar at the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. He is also a recipient of the Sorrell and Lorraine Chesson JDC Archives Fellowship. Yuri Kaparlin will now start his lecture. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to start by thanking all DDC Archive staff for supporting my research and allowing me to work with the unique archival materials. Uh, as a recipient uh, of the Sorrow and Lorraine Chase and Fellowship, I want to say special thanks to all donors who make possible this cooperation. Personal thanks to Mr. Sorrow Ray. Today, I want to present you my ongoing research project called Between, uh, Between Soviet Modernization and Holocaust, Jewish Agrarian Settlements in Southern Ukraine, 1924-1948. In my research, I study uh, the history of the local Jewish community in Ukraine and focus on the experience of violence against community members under the Soviet and Nazi regimes during 1920s, 1940s. I draw attention to the multi-ethnicity and multiculturalism of Ukrainian history, in particular to Ukrainian-Jewish relations in, at this time. 
the first slide uh, of this presentation, uh, and you can see here the family of uh, Jewish peasants from the village of Bobrovi Kut, which is today Kherson uh, Oblast in Ukraine. We don't know the names of the or the exact date of the photograph, uh, which is uh, tentatively dated by middle 20s, 1920s. However, we see young people ready, ready to work and build a better future for their children. At least until the late 1920s, many Jews had hope for this. Uh, however, as this presentation will, sh will show, uh, there were many more tragic stories than stories of success. I want to start uh, uh, from a couple of words about literature related to my work. In recent decades, several books have been published uh, on the topic of the Jewish uh, agrarian settlements in Ukraine. Uh, I will mention only a few of them. The monograph, uh, for example, of, by Volodymyr Shukin and Andriy Pavluk provides the most complete history of Jewish agrarian colonies from their foundation in early 19th century. Uh, to Soviet period. Jonathan Dekelchen book provides an in-depth analysis of Soviet policy in the process of Jewish um, agrarization in interwar period. Mikhail Mitzel's book uh, focused on the repression of employers of agrojoint and organizations that assisted Jewish settlers. Tzvi Gittelman's book show a general background of Soviet era uh, for Jewish community in Soviet Union where the moving to countryside was one of the opportunities to become a part of Soviet society. And finally, a collection of documents on the history of Stalindorf, a Jewish national district, which existed uh, in the uh, present day Dnepropetrovsk Oblast of Ukraine, was recently published uh, and edited by Ukrainian historian Albert Wenge. Uh, but uh, I have my, uh, based on these uh, publications, on these books, uh, I post my own research questions and focus mostly on the Kherson region as uh, one of the main centers of Jewish resettlement process. And my research questions could be divided in uh, three groups according to uh, chronology. The first one is interwar period. Um, how did the Soviet policy transform Jewish life in southern Ukraine? or what was the impact of total collectivization and Holodomor uh, and great terror on Jewish local community. Uh, second group, it's World War II uh, period. Uh, what were Jewish uh, and Gentile responses to anti-Jewish violence? Who were the perpetrators? Who collaborated and why during the Holocaust? And uh, third uh, uh, part is post-war period. Uh, uh, how did the Soviet authorities respond to the destruction of Jewish population? What happened to Jewish property? Who was held accountable and what trials occurred for collaboration? Were murdered Jews commemorated locally, if at all? Uh, geography and methodology. Uh, using the method of local and micro history, I focus on Kherson Oblast, uh, Kherson or Kherson region in southern Ukraine, where there were about 40 Jewish villages in which residents were engaged in agricultural labor before the outbreak of World War II. Depending on the historical period, the name Kherson was used for both a larger province called Gubernia in Russian Empire and smaller districts called Akruga and then region called uh, Oblast. And it's also the name of a large city, a modern region centered in contemporary Ukraine. A couple of words about sources and collections in my work. In my work, I analyze a wide range of sources like published and unpublished materials, literature, poetry, artworks, oral history, testimonies, archival documents, audio records, and video chronicles. And uh, there are mainly collections from uh, following institutions like GDC Archive, State Archive of Kherson Oblast in Ukraine, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Center for Holocaust Studies in Leibniz Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, Yad Vashem, Yahad Enunum, uh, uh, Shua Foundation, uh, Visual History uh, Archive, Ivo Institute for uh, Jewish Research, and uh, others. 
If uh, we consider the GDCR fives collection separately, it contains the following collections related to my work, like archival documents collection, photograph collection, historic film, video and audio collection, artifacts collection, and online exhibitions. Uh, I want to give you a brief uh, background of uh, how did Jewish agricultural settlements appear in southern Ukraine. So the first Jewish agrar agrar agrarian settlements were, uh, were founded uh, in southern Ukraine in the early 19th century, when these lands were a part of Russian Empire and uh, were part of so-called Pale of Settlement. Uh, so originally formed in uh, 1791, the Pale of Settlement was a region designated for Jews, and uh, in early 1970, the Pale of Settlements was abolished, permitting Jews to live where they wished. And this region continued to be a center of Jewish communal life until World War II. From Russian Empire to uh, Soviet initiative. So starting uh, 1806, uh, government programs promoted Jewish agricultural colonization in Russian Empire, and two factors uh, factors draw official enthusiasm. The first, um, physiocratic theories the, from the West about uh, integrating Jews through, through agriculture had uh, begun to circulate among uh, Russian elites. And second, that the Tsars uh, thought to populate new Russia, so-called Novorossia, with non-Muslims, and uh, for this and other reasons, the regime of Tsars, uh, Tsar Alexander I, uh, uh, endorsed Jewish agricultural colonization. And on this map, uh, actually created in the 1920s, you can see um, the whole Jewish agrarian settlements created uh, 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 before the Soviet uh, period and uh, after. And uh, in total, it was created until 1920s, 1930s, five national Jewish district uh, in uh, southern uh, Ukraine. Uh, prospects for Jews remained bleak even after the Pale of Settlement was abolished in middle 1970, and many Jews were called a former exploiters by Bolshevik constitution of 1980. Agricultural colonization emerged as a solution for this crisis because farmers and other, uh, other so-called productive laborers uh, regained their civil rights under uh, Soviet law. In 1924, some Jewish leaders uh, uh, called for government-sponsored uh, agricultural colonization around the Black Sea region, and later than a year, three foreign Philanthropies, uh, the Joint Agricultural Cooperation of the Jewish uh, Joint Distribution Committee, or so called Agro Joint, the Jewish Colonization Association, and the Organization for Rehabilitation of Jews Through Training, ORT, entered a series of uh, contacts with Kremlins to allow Jews uh, from the former Pale of Settlements to settle in northern Crimea and southern Ukraine. Early plans proposed to resettle as many as half a million Jews. In 1924, a landmark event took place uh, that opened up uh, new opportunities for thousands of Jews to resettle in rural areas. The Soviet government entered into an agreement with the Jewish Distribution Committee to establish the agro-joint organization, which was provide various kinds of support to help the settlers from building materials and advanced agricultural machinery to services of professional agronomists and engineers to help them learn a new business. And agro-joint branches uh, have been opened in many large cities, including those uh, close to uh, resettlement centers such as Kherson. Before the large-scale work uh, on Jewish uh, uh, organization, uh, GDC staff had been working in southern Ukraine for several years to help overcome the effect of pogroms and famine that affected a large part of Jewish population. The recipients of the aid uh, were both individual Jewish families and orphans living in special orphanages, 
In addition, GDC staff uh, conducted surveys for uh, of old Jewish colonies, studying the needs of their inhabitants and uh, uh, the possible potential for future development that began uh, since 1924. So since 1924, tens of thousands of acres of land were, were allocated in the south of Ukraine, especially in Kherson region. Uh, life was not easy for first settlers uh, uh, few, the first few years, and they were forced to live in makeshift uh, huts and dugouts, but soon most of them were able to build houses. And in the middle 1920s, the settlers received considerable material support from GDC. Thus, this part of Ukrainian history is connected to the history of USA and American charitable foundations led by joint. GDC put a lot of effort into raising charitable funds to buy all necessities for people who, uh, many of whom um, were new to farming. In particular, US tractors have become one of the symbols of set settlers. Uh, and on this picture, you can see the models, Waterloo Boy and John Deere tractors, uh, which is uh, selling till today in US. Uh, and uh, they uh, were sent to uh, Ukraine at this time. Also, you can see that uh, um, GDC, uh, AgroJoint provided the um, education, and you can see this uh, uh, picture where the tractor driver courses uh, was organized uh, in Kherson. In 1927, an important event took place in Kherson region, uh, the opening of the first national district in USSR that centered in the village of Kaliningrad, formerly Velika Seydeminuha, the district was named after one of the Bolshevik leaders, Mikhail Kalinin. On the territory of the Kherson district, uh, which roughly equals the territory of modern Kherson uh, Oblast, substantial land funds were allocated for the establishment and development of Jewish farms. And uh, you can see uh, the territories mentioned uh, on this map. And for better understanding uh, the scale of this map, map, I can point out that the area of Kherson Oblast is uh, it's a close but uh, larger than the area of modern state of Israel. And uh, for your better understanding the places and uh, image of people who live there, I offer you to watch a short episode from a uh, documentary chronicle uh, created by Agro joint employers, where you can see uh, real people, real specialists on the ground in Kherson region. It says that the nature of the land uh, of the left bank of Dnipro River is uh, poor and, and sandy. This area called today like Oleshkivsky Sands, Oleshkivsky Sands uh, National uh, Park. However, it's possible to grow valuable crops at this sense with irrigation and fertilizers. The well built by agrojoint engineers
work in garden. Tomatoes. Cucumbers. Some fruit trees. This uh, fruit harvest. Melons. Watermelons. It says that uh, the development of farms is hampered by a pest, the larva of the marble beetle. And you can see the wine yard that died. But uh, Professor Agronomist Bovianco, in cooperation with AgroJoint, found a way to fight pests with pesticides. Wine yard, save it because pesticides, yeah. So this really unique chronicle, uh, what you can find in GDC archive collection, but not only uh, the chronicles are interested uh, for me, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, in GDC archive among the official documentation, we can find the valuable autobiographical information uh, that give us an idea of a patch of juice from living in the city or shtetl and to moving uh, to a village. Uh, and example is the story of uh, Shaya Medovoy, born in uh, Zlatopol, Kiev, Gubernia, uh, merchant, um, uh, married, uh, who survived the pogroms, uh, told that uh, he was robbed uh, and um, wounded during these events. And uh, he said that uh, he began to work on factory, but uh, my er earnings were not enough for, to make living. Uh, as soon as I heard that Jews were being given land and uh, that our American brothers um, provide this help, I began to consult with my wife the question of going on the soil. At first, I feared it. Uh, we sat there for days crying and calling to God, uh, he should send us uh, his wise instruction. Finally, we decided to go and uh, the day we took this decision is the most lucky in our life. I turned it to the soil, performed the hard work on it myself. We all settled in Kherson 
district. At last, I found the, that which, which I needed. Uh, another interesting question, what I want to bring your attention is um, resettlement and Jewish intelligentsia. So in the middle 1920s, the idea of resettlement used to Southern Ukraine gained a, uh, a support of wide range of domestic and foreign Jewish intellectuals. And uh, they called to, for support for Jew, Jewish land uh, surveying carried out uh, by Soviet authorities in Soviet Union. Uh, example, the uh, Itzhak Ber Rybak, painter, graphic artist, and sculptor active in the Jewish art renaissance. Um, Itzhak Ber Rybak was born in uh, Kropivnitsky, former Elizabethgrad in Ukraine. He attended uh, art school and then studied at the Art Academy of Kiev from 1911 to 1916. Following the Russian Revolution of 1970, the Central Committee of Kult Culture League in Kyiv appointed Rybak uh, to be a driving teacher. In his capacity, he visited Jewish agricultural communities, memorials of which appear in his later, in, in his, uh, later work, such as a lithographic album called On the Jewish Fields of Ukraine, published in Paris in 1926. So in his introduction uh, to the album, uh, Rybak uh, uh, wrote that friends, friends would often say to me, well, Rybak, you know only the crooked, broken, pale-faced Jew of the towns, the type of pretty trader, commissioner, agent, Luftmensch. Why do you not go down to the steps where the Jews have come into contact with the soil? Then you will forget your pale faces, cripples. You will find there a new, proud type of Jew. I went. For two months, I lived in the new Jewish villages in the province of Kherson and in the Crimea. I slept in their huts and shared their bread and potato meals, watched them at work and saw them at rest, and was amazed at the change that had taken place during the two years since the new movement had begun. Rybak's artistic work have left us with unique images of Jews from her son's steps, which we can compare to the very real images uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, GDC Archive uh, Agro Joint Specialist uh, took there. Uh, another important question what I want to discuss today is um, collectivization and uh, how the more. So Jewish resettlement began uh, began in middle 1920s under the favorable conditions of uh, the so-called new economic policy in Soviet Union. But by the end of the 1920s, the situation had changed. Along with the several years of poor harvest, uh, the Soviet government embraced on a new course of collectivization, which uh, allegedly culminated in the Holodomor, a mass famine organized and used by Soviet government as a weapon against peasants disloyal to collectivization. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, agro-joint activity in the region almost stopped. But this was the result not only of internal changes in Soviet policy, but also uh, of the Great Depression in the United States. The brief report on the activities of the Ukrainian Office of AgroJoint for the period from January 1st, 1934 to January 1st, 1935, which was concluded in Jewish agricultural, agricultural settlement, noted that due to the poor harvest of 1932, the collective farms were in unusually difficult situation. There were cases of death from starvation. And the role and significance of assistant of agrojoint at this time can be imagined at least from the fact that the population had no reserves, meaning food reserves at all. The fact about life under collectivization and how the more are also preserved in memories of members of peasant Jewish families. For example, Mikhail Kravtsov, uh, uh, who was born uh, in 1927 in the village of Emes, recalled that 
My grandfather and father died during the famine in 1933. My mother, Haya, sent my younger brother to an orphanage. After that, we moved to Alchevsk. Another story from Rahil Vorobyov. Uh, she recalled that my father also died in 1933, and he was 42 years old. Our family worked on the collective farm. We received two, 300 grams of grain per uh, labor day. Life was difficult, not only for Jews, but for whole people. And during the collectivization, they, meaning NKVD units, government uh, troops, took away cows and chickens, and it was very difficult. In early September 1933, an American journalist and the forward newspaper um, uh, for the new uh, for, for the uh, forward newspaper Harry Lang arrived in uh, USSR and he spent some time in Soviet Ukraine and being uh, Jewish descent and fluent in Yiddish, he was able to communicate with some local Jews. And after returning to the United States, Lang published about 30 articles about his trip in the forward newspaper, including the horrors of the mass famine in Ukraine. For example, he described how he heard about following uh, during a conversation with the workers of the Reuterstern Jewish collective farm in Kharkiv region. Another raid took place in Kaliningrad collective farm. They found 15 puts of hidden wheat. The shadow of the dead and famine of the previous spring and summer can be found in every village. And there are signs that a new, fire, uh, a new famine will soon come. In this case, people tried to hide small stock of grain and bread. However, if hidden wheat was found, there are probably more places in the collective farm. There were searchers. searchers. Uh, there were sudden attacks on warehouses and houses. For hiding wheat, there was a prison sentence and often death. I heard this in the company of Jewish collective farmers who came to Kharkiv. After the completion of collectivization and Holodomor, there are still thousands of residents in Jewish agricultural settlements who continued to work in collective farm system. Gradually, by the middle 1930s, they managed to recover from the requisition and the effects of famine. For its part, uh, the Soviet government did not abandon the idea of transforming Jewish settlements, uh, settlements into exemplary national administrative territorial units that would adopt the new principles of social economy. In 1937, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the formation of the Kaliningrad district, the world first Jewish national district, one of the leaders of the OZ, uh, pro-Soviet organization, uh, Bragin, advocated turning the Kaliningrad anniversary into a holiday for Jewish workers, not only in USSR, but also abroad. Celebrating took place uh, on December uh, 26, 27, 1937, with numerous rallies, festival demonstrations, and a festival plenum uh, of the district executive committee. The press, uh, the press was full of articles praising the achievements of the Jewish National District and the improvement in the living standards of peasantry, obviously, contrasting them with the policy of the West, in particular Nazi Germany, where anti-Semitism was taken on treatment forms. One correspondent wrote down that, let's take, for example, the collective farmer Shapovalov, who have a cow, a heifer from last year, and two heifer from this year, and a pig. The collective farmers of his artel, like all the workers of Soviet homeland, thanks to the great leader, Comrade Stalin, for the joyful present. Of course, uh, today this sounds uh, ironic because uh, at the same time, in the midst of the celebration uh, and the festive atmosphere, purges began once again among the settlers. Thus, 1937, in addition to the 
anniversary of the creation of the first Jewish national district was marked by the beginning of the great terror and new mass repressions. Among the repressed representatives of agro-joint top management was the organization deputy director Samuel Lubarsky, who headed the agronomic department serving Jewish settlements in Kherson and Katerinoslav provinces. On March 27, 1938, he was arrested. And on September 1st, the military collegium of USSR Supreme Court sentenced Lubarsky to capital punishment and executed him on same day. He was buried in the village of Butovo, a modern suburb of Moscow. And only on October 13, 1959, he was rehabilitated. In addition to senior officials, mass repression covered the middle management of agro-joint employers. For example, one of the chief agronomists of the Kherson region, Aron Zaychik, was repressed. Zaychik started work for joint in 1922 and then headed the Kherson branch of agro-joint during 1920s. In 1930, he was on an internship in the United States. And his arrest took place in Moscow in November 1937. And he was held in Butyrka prison until May 1938. Zaychik was accused of participating in an anti-Soviet organization and sentenced to imprisonment in a labor camp for five years, where on March 12, 1943, uh, he died in uh, one of the Magadan camps in the deep rush. Uh, but of course, uh, not only, uh, not only employers of agrojoint were, were oppressed, the ordinary, ordinary collective farmers also were oppressed. And in my work, I have analyzed the materials of individual criminal cases that have been declassified in Ukraine the, in the recent decades. Among them, one of the most illustrative is the case against Moisei Weisspapir. Uh, the Weisspapir family lived in old Jewish village of Bobrovikut, and Moisei was a farmer who worked as a livestock farm manager. His wife, Risa, was also a collective farmer. The couple had two sons, Arkady and Benjamin, and uh, a daughter, Basia. Before collectivization, Moisei father and grandfather rented a mill. The family uh, ran a household consisting of eight horses, eight cattle, and uh, 30, 40 hectares, hectares of land with the help of hired laborers. To avoid uh, decollectivization, uh, Moisei uh, sold part of his farm and worked on a collective farm. The family survived Holodomor. However, he still managed to avoid arrest uh, during the Great uh, Terror. In 1937, Moisei Vaspapir was accused of being a former member of a Zionist organization who retained an anti-Soviet attitude. And after that, Vaspapir was uh, sent to prison in Kherson for detention by the decision of Troika some very local court. On April 16, 1938, uh, Moisei Weispapir was sentenced to death, and the sentence was carried out on June 10 at 12 a.m. in Kherson. Simultaneously with the killing or with the killings, the Soviet authorities continued to talk about the happy life in the Jewish collective farms. Uh, for a broad audience, and the relevant story was uh, included in the chronicles of the Soviet film magazine uh, called USSR on Screen, what I'm offered to watch this short episode of this magazine. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 
Thus, until the end of 1930s, uh, the social economic experiment of Jewish resettlement uh, did not fully achieve its goals, primarily due to the collectivization, political repressions, and uh, changes in the foundation of Soviet national politics from the integration of ethnic minorities to Soviet society to assimilation of them. In March 1939, the Central Committee of Communist Party adopted a resolution on the elimination and transformation of artificially created national areas and village councils, which were called the centers of enemies of the people. Unlike most, Jewish national areas formerly were not liquidated, but finally Holocaust and World War II destroyed this unique world of Jewish farmers' communities that existed in southern Ukraine. So Holocaust started on these lands in the first month after German troops occupied the region in August 1941. And anti-Jewish violence in 1941 included the next steps. Local authorities learned about occupiers genocidal intention. Germans gathered information about Jewish population. They did selection of execution sites, separation of Jews from non-Jews, Roundups and imprisonment in public buildings, such as schools, clubs, or collective farmhouses. Movement of Jewish victims to mass killing sites, execution of mass murder, and collection and distribution of uh, Jewish uh, property. Among the among all the Jews who were unable to evacuate before the Germans arrived in 1941 were murdered. Therefore, there is almost no study of the circumstances under which the Holocaust took place in the region from the perspective of Jewish victims. And basic information about the Nazi crimes was collected during the investigation of the Extraordinary Commission, which began working in the region in 1944. However, in recent published article, I was able to investigate the events on the, uh, of the Holocaust at the micro level uh, in this village called uh, Neuwelt, or in translation from Hebrew, New Life. Uh, this was possible thanks to the discovery of a several hour interview with uh, Rita Rosenberg, which was recorded by uh, Schwarzheim uh, staff in New York. And in 1941, Rita came to her aunt uh, Lisa Hirschman house to the village in her own region from Kyiv for vacation. And uh, almost immediately after the arrival of the Sonder Commando, uh, Jews were ordered to move to the local school with their most valuable belongings. They were divided into three groups, women with children, men and women without children. Rita was in the first group, which was locked up in the separate classroom. Local police officers were in the charge of the process. Everything happened in the morning and soon covered trucks starting arriving at school. Armed Germans stood near the trucks and the police showed where to get in. Soon the trucks filled with people who were on their way. According to Rita testimony, at first they drove along the road, but then turned it into a field. And she recalled that that's when I, I realized it was the end. Uh, when they started unload, unloading people, I saw a pill, a pill of clothes, among which I recognized my aunt's dress. Then I saw a well with the blood around uh, and uh, Germans with machine guns. There were, were two Ukrainians standing next to me. My aunt's neighbor, who lived across the street, named Billy, and another who was a village elder. There were dogs around the German standing on a uh, small hill. It was an old well uh, that was no longer in use, called Bila Krenice. 
Germans ordered us to strip naked. Most of the Jews started to undress, but Rosa, the, uh, Rita's aunt's uh, um, daughter-in-law, Rosa refused. People were brought to the well to be shot and thrown into it. People were screaming, crying, be not to be killed, but there was nowhere to go. One German started to force Rosa to undress and she spat in his face. Then, she, then he pushed her to the well and first shot the child on her arms and then Rosa herself. When we first got out from the truck, Rosa told me to run away, but where could I run when there were Germans with sheepdogs around? Thus, Rita found herself in the last line of people doomed to be shot. She noticed a German who was given orders. She dared to approach him and said that she was here by accident and that her father was Russian. She said that their neighbor, Billy, could confirm this. And uh, uh, Rita recalls that I pointed to Billy and German asked him, and he noted his head in approval. Rita recalls that I kissed his boots, I kissed his boots, asked him not kill me, said that I was Russian, and she were released. Having no warm clothes, Rita decided to return back to her village. She came to Billy, her neighbor, home and asked him to help her to get things her aunt had hidden in the garden. Out of everything, uh, out of everything he found, he gave her a couple of sheets and a warm scarf and took everything else for himself. The girl felt that it would be dangerous to stay under Billy's supervision for a long time, so she left for another village. Rita Rosenberg survived the war and Holocaust was adopted by a Ukrainian woman who lived in neighboring village with her daughter. Obviously, the appearance of a lonely girl had a logical explanation for this woman, but she took a risk. I should remind that the Nazis punished it the hiding of Jews by local non-Jews with a death penalty. In 1944, after the liberation of the territories from Nazi occupation, evacuated Jews and Red Army veterans began to return to their homes. Some of them were horrified to learn of the fate of their relatives and friends with whom they had lost contact in 1944. They also initiated the creation of the first memorial monuments at the killing sites. Some families trying to return to their pre-war homes faced bureaucratic difficulties in obtaining the relevant documents, while others found the new owners in their homes, which became a cause for disputes. In any case, some people hoped for an attempt to restore Jewish life. However, by the end of 1940s, the Soviet authorities had launched an anti-Semitic campaign that excluded any privileges for Jews. Most Jewish villages were renamed to ethnically natural names and representatives of other nations and ethnic groups uh, were settled there. In the late 1940s, uh, Rosa Kleiner worked uh, as an accountant uh, in Kaliniske, former Kaliningrad, and in her uh, in her testimony, she recalled that um, anti-Semitism was in full swing. After graduation, I got a job in Kaliningrad, which used to be the center of the Jewish National District. In my department, the head and chief accountant were Jews. I remember a comment from one of the local party officials. What is it? Are you? setting up a synagogue here. Three Jews, why do we need this synagogue? Who sent you here? Almost simultaneously, the Soviet authorities announced a new wave of Jewish resettlement to Berebejan, to far east of Russia. And according to official data, data alone, in 1947-48, more 6,000 Jews arrived in Berebejan from the western part of the Soviet Union, and up to 3,000 of whom were settlers from Kherson region. 
anti-Semitism could have been one of the motives for a settlement from the villages where the Soviet authorities began the next stage of their social engineering. At the official level, the history of the Jews in the region was virtually, uh, virtually silenced until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So concluding, I want to say that World War II and Holocaust were crucial destructive forces that ruined a unique phenomenon of Jewish agricultural settlements in Kherson region in particular and Southern Ukraine in general. This history is an integral part of Ukrainian and Jewish history. It is important to remember the history of Jewish people who, driven by idealism and ideology, tried to secure a better future, lived with their Ukrainian neighbors for centuries, made possible cont a positive contribution to local societies, and were murdered in their hometowns during Nazi Holocaust. After war, the history of Jewish victims and survivors was hidden by Soviet policy because of the rising anti-Semitic campaign. And in this work, I'm trying somehow to restore this previously repressed history and memory. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to have your comments uh, and uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuri, for sharing your extensive research with us um, today. This has been extremely interesting. We now open the floor to questions. Please note that your microphones are muted and you can send us your questions via the Q&A function. Um, we will share questions with Yuri after, the, after today's program so that if your question is not answered, he can he still can see it and answer it to you at a, at a later date. Um, and Yuri, I see that we already have a number of questions. Um, one is whether you included Bessarabia in your research. Um, yes, thank, thank you so much. This is a great question because um, I'm focusing mostly on Kherson region, but uh, uh, it was not unique uh, Jewish agrarism at all because uh, as I mentioned, uh, it, in total, it was five uh, Jewish national districts created in uh, 1920s and 1930s in, in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, other Jewish uh, agrarian settlements also were created in other regions, and uh, especially on the border between uh, contemporary Ukraine and Moldova, so in Bessarabia, it's a region so-called Bessarabia. And um, uh, I, 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 I'm not focusing on this region, but uh, I know this story uh, more, uh, more studied, uh, well studied uh, in uh, Russian Empire uh, times period than in what happened in Soviet times. But uh, I, I did find um, uh, an album, album from um, Odessa region, uh, which is very close to Bessarabia, and uh, how the uh, international organizations uh, um, help it, uh, the inhabitants of these uh, settlements in this region, especially uh, ORT organization, ORT, not AgroJoint, because uh, we know AgroJoint more uh, was more focused on um, southern Ukraine, Kherson, Mykolaiv, Dnipropetrovsk uh, Oblast uh, and uh, Crimea, and uh, ORT uh, was focused uh, more in Bessarabia, Romania, and this um, uh, this borderland um, uh, agrarian settlement. So um, I'm not studying the Bessarabian settlements, but I, I'm, I'm I know about this uh, uh, settlements too. Maybe not too deep. Yeah. So the the next question is, I guess, a little bit about the background. What happened to those Jews during uh, World War One? Uh, yes, yeah, so as, as you saw my chronology, I'm, I'm trying to focus mostly on Soviet period, but um, you can read uh, where it, in many details what happened uh, in uh, Jewish um, colonies in southern Ukraine, uh, in particular in Kherson region uh, during World War II in the book of um, um, what I mentioned on the start, it's um, Vladimir Shukin and Andrei Pavluk book. They, they, they are focused uh, mostly on uh, Russian Empire times. And uh, we know that uh, some uh, Jews uh, from, but I can answer, of course, because I, 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 I learned this book. Uh, uh, the, the Jews from settlements, they, some, of them, uh, some of them stayed during World War I in their settlements and worked on, on their land. 
some of them uh, were, were uh, mobilized and participated in uh, on front line on in, in they served in russian army and um, when uh, in the end of world war one uh, we know that uh, the wave of pogroms happened uh, on the territory of ukraine in, especially in 1970 1980 and Kherson regions uh, Kherson region was um, uh, also in this uh, in this zone and we know some Jewish villages, for example, like uh, uh, one village called uh, Lvovo, uh, it's old Jewish um, uh, um, uh, settlement, uh, uh, and until today it's a village called Lvovo in Ukraine. Uh, uh, in this village, uh, was uh, the, the camp for refugees was created, and um, uh, uh, the self defend uh, self defend group from Jews were created there. To prevent the pogroms in the region, so that's how people tried to sur survive the gangs, because we know pogrom pogrom uh, often uh, happened uh, from different. Uh, 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 the perpetrators was uh, were different groups. It it it, it was uh, white army, uh, red army. It was uh, Ottomans from uh, Ukrainian People Republic. Um, it was just just guns, uh, gangs, you know, and um, they, they tried to survive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, we have a number of questions about, that have to do with uh, Palestine and Israel and, 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 your, and your topic, and I'm going to, to group, try to group them together. The first one, probably I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, so bear with me. Hopefully you can understand the question. Um, in Kherson, were there individuals or groups who have come from Palestine, like the Alkin Ein Harad Voyo Novo group in Crimea? Do you understand what is meant here? Mm -hmm. um, actually, you can also open the, yeah, it's the first question in the QA. Um, uh, uh... I, I I don't know uh, any members in Kherson region uh, of uh, I, I don't have any information about people who uh, who came uh, from uh, Palestine, but um, uh, in uh, the book of Jonathan Dekel Chen, what I mentioned on the start, he discussed a lot of um, this uh, Zionist movement in Soviet Ukraine and so-called Palestine question, you know, because we know that some people um, uh, or, uh, who, who, who were uh, settlers and peasants from Ukraine uh, in the middle 1920s, uh, they were offered by Zionists to move to Palestine. And some of them received uh, the training in this, uh, in this um, new created uh, Jewish um, settlements and then moved to Palestine. And, uh, we know that uh, Soviet government um, uh, uh, made illegal the Zionist movement in the Soviet Union, especially in Soviet Ukraine, and it was like a uh, conflict uh, of interest between uh, Soviet government and Zionist movement uh, and representatives of Zionist movement in Ukraine and uh, abroad. So it's really interesting question and it's a big big part of research, but um, I'm for, unfortunately I, uh, I, I'm not able to include all questions in my uh, to today's presentation. Yeah, thank you. Of course, um, and I think you partly answered another question, which is why they did not immigrate to Israel in the 1920s to establish kibbutz in um, some 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 people immigrated. Some some of them uh, did so, but until the end 1920s, um, uh, Soviet government uh, physically stopped this uh, this movement uh, to 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 just uh, freely freely leave Ukraine, you know, and move anywhere abroad. Um, and there is another um, question related related to to that. Um, have you found much evidence of the great dispute between the GDC and the Zionists over the Agro Joint project? Um, of course, the end of the Agro Joint suggested to supporters of Zionism that they were right all along. Um, did you see any of this in your source? Um, um. I want to mention that uh, uh, I found in GDC archive some uh, correspondence uh, from US 
Um, I had the slide, but I deleted it because because lack of time. Uh, where where was discussion between uh, what GDC do collecting money uh, in US for support um, Soviet Jews, and uh, in in the letter to correspondence to the newspaper, they the author asked it. So what we are really support, especially he he was interested in the cultural work. So. We know that uh, Agra Joint was mostly um, mostly focused on the economic support and material support, and the cultural work uh, was provided from pro-Soviet organizations like Comzet and OZ, which was which were created in Soviet um, Union itself. And um, uh, the question was: so, what we are really support? Uh, and authors um, criticized uh, Joint and other organizations uh, for. Uh, ignoring that, uh, in fact, uh, Soviets um, provide uh, like uh, anti anti Jewish uh, culture because they tried to fight uh, religion, uh, not only not only Judaism but whole religion. But in fact, they they tried to like to change uh, Jewish minds and uh, be, be, um, made them made them uh, like uh, uh, not not religious people. So. It's it's also like uh, interesting questions. Uh, what I found in GDC archives materials. Um, so, so there are two questions that again I think can be grouped together. Um, the first one is there a list of the Jews who live there, um, and I suppose that's for the entire period you're covering. And the second question again has to do with numbers. Do we? know how many Jews there were arrested and executed in the Great Terror and how many total Jews had been in that area? It's a really important question and uh, uh, we don't have a full statistic. We don't have full statistic how many people uh, had experience working in these collective farms because uh, since 1924 and till late 1930s this always uh, was Unstopped, unstopped, unstopped process of um, moving to colonies and from them because some people who came they okay they accepted accepted these new uh, conditions of life they tried to build their uh, farms some of them didn't find for them this like uh, their future and they they left so we, we don't have statistic of how many uh, people got this uh, experience work on the land and um, what about the great terror we we don't have uh, a full statistic of repressed too uh, i mentioned the uh, the book of um, uh, mikhail mitzel uh, about the agrogen during um, great terror and him he provided some statistic and names of, of uh, criminal cases uh, and we can find find the hundreds of names uh, already uh, identified who were repressed. But um, I won't say uh, this uh, this is open uh, question for future research uh, to make uh, the verified statistic of uh, the great uh, great terror um, uh, victims and. Um, uh, we in in every in every region in Ukraine we have a book a book of memory of um, of victims of great terror and uh, it's it's really massive massive volumes and uh, in this volumes is thousands of names but without uh, without um, uh, like um, uh, splitting of ethnicity. You know, it's 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 uh, uh, it's it's it it it, it made uh, in alphabet uh, order. You know, so and uh, maybe the, the easiest way uh, to make some first uh, statistic is try to review all the names because most of them uh, identified. Uh, we in 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 many cases we can identify Jewish people by the name or uh, it's mentioned in the short biographical biographical uh, information uh, in, in this uh, memory book. So it is open question, but thank you, it's, it's really important. Um, we have a few more questions, but unfortunately I, I just have time for one. Uh, so um, what do you know about Jews who escaped to Canada and the United States um, during the Holodrome? 
Voldemort during the Voldemort? Yeah, Voldemort. The person fell in like this from Voldemort. Um, in my research, I I don't have examples of uh, Jews uh, from uh, this region who who were uh, moved to Canada. But I, of course, I'm using the uh, in my my source. I also, I also use the um, uh, Holodomor Research uh, uh, Education Consortium uh, Archive, uh, the one of the main institution studying the Holodomor in the world. And uh, there are many, many uh, testimonies from people who moved to, from Ukraine to Canada. But uh, at this moment, I didn't find any, um, any testimonies uh, directly related to my work. But I, I can imagine that some people uh, uh, moved not only to Canada, but also to US. And uh, I, I didn't tell you on the start, but uh, uh, maybe you can stop on this and the end uh, that Jewish agrarianism, it's also a part of your United States history because some of Jewish uh, agrarian settlements also were created uh, in the United States in the end of 90, early 20th century. And uh, we know that this was time when, when many uh, Jews from Ukraine uh, fled to US and I don't know, maybe between them we can find people from Jewish settlements who had this um, uh, uh, experience work on the land and they tried to realize it uh, came to us. I don't know. It's it's too much open questions in this research. That, that is an interesting, uh, an interesting thought. Um, thank you again, Yuri, uh, for your fascinating presentation. Um, thank you to our audience members for joining us today. Um, thank you, Soel Chesson, for introducing uh, Yuri. And uh, thank you to the Miriam Mimi Pasternak Tobin Public Educational Programming from the GDC Archives for making today's program possible. Uh, our next program will take place on September 26. Rebecca Cobrin, a recipient of the Fred and Ellen Lewis GDC Archives Fellowship, will give a lecture on GDC and the power of female diplomacy, the life and leadership of Laura Margulis and Olga Feinberg between 1939 and 1949. Um, invitations will be sent in early um, September. Um, you will be also able to sign up for the program via the GDC Archives website. Um, please sign up for our e-newsletter if you'd like to be added to our mailing list for um, upcoming public programs. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you in the fall. Thank you. <laughs>